السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We continue inshallah after a long pause our study of the life of Ibrahim عليه السلام as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned and praised Ibrahim alayhi salam in many sites in the Quran and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that Ibrahim is Khalil al-Rahman wa Ibrahim Khalila he is the friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him Imam al-Nas made him the leader for humanity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said wa idh tala Ibrahim rabbuhu bi kalimatin fa atammahun قال إني جاعلك للناس إماما قال ومن ذريتي قال لا ينال عهد الظالمين الله سبحانه وتعالى said and remember that Ibrahim was tried by his Lord he was tried by Allah سبحانه وتعالى with certain commands we would inshallah we will go through some of them tonight which he fulfilled and said Allah said I will make you Ibrahim an imam to mankind and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that in the progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah limited after him prophethood and the revelation. All the revelation, all the prophethood came after Ibrahim alayhi salam. And we see that in the uh, progeny, in the family tree of Ibrahim, if you will, you will see all the prophets and the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah sent to humanity and mankind after Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the importance of Ibrahim alayhi salam is enormous for our religion of Islam and we know how we mention Ibrahim alayhi salam in every prayer and in every time we mention uh, our Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the end of each salah. We studied how Ibrahim alayhi salam lived in the area of uh, Iraq, southern Iraq today in the Mesopotamia, in the uh, cradle of civilization and uh, how he then uh, faced the tyrants and the pagans uh, of his people and then Ibrahim alayhi salam made his hijrah made his immigration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send him to the holy land Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that hijrah in the Quran فَآمَنَ لَهُ لُوطُ وَقَالَ إِنِّي مُهَاجِرٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّي إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ and Lut had faith in Ibrahim. Lut submitted to the faith of Ibrahim. And then he said, I will leave home for the sake of my Lord. I will make the hijrah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For he, Allah, is exalted in might and wise. We study tonight one of the trips of Ibrahim alayhi salam. After he, men, he went to the, the promise to the holy land, to the area of uh, Philistine and some of the uh, interpreters and some of the uh, commentators on the Quran they said he migrated generally to the area of Asham, to the Levant and uh, most agree that he settled definitely in Philistine may Allah lift the calamity over Philistine and uh, mostly in the town of Hebron and this town of Hebron is known today as Al Khalil it's got its name after the Prophet of Allah Ibrahim alayhi salam Khalil rahman However, the, uh, the interpreters of the Quran and people that uh, study the seer, the biographies of the Prophet said that Ibrahim made a trip to Egypt. And the cause of that trip to Egypt was debated. Most agree that there was a time of famine, time of drought in Palestine. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, like many people of that area, would go to the uh, area that is always fertile by the presence of a Nile, by, by presence of the river Nile. And there always be food most time in Egypt. So Ibrahim alayhi salam went and took his wife Sarah. And Sarah 
uh, is uh, the wife that immigrated with Ibrahim alayhi salam from his home country, from uh, Mesopotamia. And Sarah was described in these books of Athiya as one of the most beautiful women on the face of the earth. And as an athar, as is narrated in the book of Qasas al-Anbiya uh, by uh, Al-Hafiz al-Allama ibn Kathir, he said uh, that Sarah, or Sarah, was the most beautiful woman ever created after Hawa. She, so she was a very attractive woman. And Ibrahim alayhi salam walks with his wife into Egypt. And a major event happens to them in Egypt. And this is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari in more than one position. So this is a very solid hadith. This is a very authentic narration. And it is narrated, as we said, in Sahih al-Bukhari. One of the hadith that was narrated upon what the incident that happened to Ibrahim and Sarah in Egypt, that the Prophet wasallam said that Ibrahim had to tell lies three times. Two of them are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he said, Inni saqeem, when he said, I am sick, when his uh, people wanted to get out and worship their idols outside the city and he wanted to stay and destroy the idols like we studied in detail in, details in the last few sessions. And then the second time when he said that the master idol is the one that destroyed the rest of them. But our story is actually in the third time that Ibrahim alayhi salam had not to tell the truth, the whole truth. And it is uh, narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَقَالَ بَيْنَ ذَا هُوَ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ وَثَارَّ إِذْ أَتَى عَلَى جَبَّارٍ مِنَ الْجَبَابِرَةِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that one time when Ibrahim and Sarah, his wife, were going on a journey, they passed by a territory of a tyrant. And that tyrant, most of the interpreters and most of the scholars agree that it was in Egypt. And they, they conclude that from the end of the story. So we, we uh, for the uh, sake of our uh, benefit for our session, say he was in Egypt at that time. But the Prophet وسلم, he said they passed by a Jabbar, by a tyrant of al Jababira. And then the people around that tyrant told him, this man who just came to town, Ibrahim, is accompanied by a very charming lady. So the beauty of Sarah, alayhi salam, has attracted, has uh, got the attention of this tyrant. So Ibrahim was asked, who is she? Who is this woman that is with you? And Ibrahim, alayhi salam, with his uh, insight, with his intelligence, knew the intention of that question. So if he tells them that this is my wife and that tyrant wants Sarah, what is the best way to get to Sarah? Is to get rid of Ibrahim alayhi salam, is to kill Ibrahim. And he will not benefit anything if he tries to, he's in, in, a, in a land that he has no defense, he's an immigrant, he's weak, and here is this tyrant trying to take Sarah. So when he was asked, who is this woman with you? Ibrahim said, Hiya ukhti. she is my sister. And that is counted as one of the three lies that Ibrahim alayhi salam is told. But Ibrahim alayhi salam, and according to most of the scholars, again, he said this was his sister. There was only two people that professed the religion of Islam in that area. It was him and his wife. So the only sister in Allah he has in that area was his wife, Sarah. And when he said, he, 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 she was his sister in Islam. He was his sister in his religion. But he wanted them to believe that she is his biological sister. So the hadith continues. And then he came to Sarah. And he said to her, Ibrahim alayhi salam, قال يا سارة ليس على وجه الأرض مؤمن غيري وغيرك. وإن هذا سألني فأخبرته أنك أختي فلا تكذبينني. إبراهيم عليه السلام said he went to her he said oh Sarah there are no believers on the surface of this earth except you and I. This man asked me about you the tyrant asked me about you and I have told him that you are my sister 
so do not contradict my statement. So he's telling her, you are my sister. You, you, you don't have to say anything that is not true because there is nobody else than, other than you and me, believers on the face of the earth. So the tyrant then called upon Sarah. فَأَرْسَلَ إِلَيْهَا So he kidnapped basically Sarah and he uh, wanted to have her. And when, when Sarah came upon him, فَلَمَّا دَخَلَتْ عَلَيْهِ ذَهَبَ يَتَنَاوَلُهَا بِيَدِهِ When he uh, was alone with Sarah, عليه السلام, this tyrant, this aggressor, wanted to have her and he stretched out his hand to get Sarah. And another hadith, again on the authority of Al-Bukhari, uh, on the authority of Abu Huraira, in Sahih Al-Bukhari, that before she, she came, now she, here's this believer, this woman believer, alone with one of the t most aggressive tyrants on the face of the earth. So well, how does she face that tyrant? She makes wudu for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فتوضأت وصلت and then she prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then she made a dua. And then she said in that dua, فقالت اللهم إن كنت آمنت بك وبرسولك وأحصنت فرجي إلا على زوجي فلا تسلط علي الكافر. She said, oh Allah, if you know that I truly believe in you and if you know that I truly believe in your messenger and if you know that I have kept my chastity safe except for my husband, then do not let me, me be a victim of this tyrant. So she took refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She took refuge in the one that will not turn away anyone that takes refuge in him, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as this tyrant was stretching his hand to touch Sarah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in one hadith, فأخذ. He was paralyzed. He cannot move his arm. He could not do anything. And then what did he say to Sarah? He knew something abnormal is going on. He said, ادْعِ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَا أضرك. Pray to Allah for me. Pray to your Lord. And I will not harm you. So she prayed to Allah to leave him. And he has his strength back. And then he tried again. And this second time was even worse than the first time. فَأُخِذْ The Prophet ﷺ said he was paralyzed. He was taken. And then he said, إِدْعِ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَا أَضُرُّكَ And then he said, pray to for me and I will not harm you. So she prayed. And he was back to his strength. And then he sees this most beautiful woman in front of him. And he tries a third time. And it was even worse. In one hadith, in the second hadith, I was talking about the Prophet ﷺ said, فَغَطَّ حَتَّى رَكَضَ بِرِجْلِهِ He was taken and he was kicking, like he was having a seizure. If you ever seen somebody who's having a seizure, they, they kick. They kick the, the, the ground, they kick the floor. And they're just completely no control over their, their senses. And the Prophet ﷺ said, فَغَطَّ حَتَّى رَكَضَ بِرِجْلِهِ he, he was taken, and he was taken away until he was kicking with his feet. He had absolutely no power. Who has the power? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this tyrant thinks that he can do whatever he wants. And then, in the last time, he said, Pray to Allah, and I will not harm you. So, she prayed to Allah to leave him alone. And she prayed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the second hadith, he said, Allahumma in yamut, yuqalu hiya qatalathu. Oh Allah, if he dies, they will think that I killed him. She doesn't, she just wants to, to be safe. She doesn't want to, to kill him. She just wants to protect herself and her chastity and her honor as a Muslim woman. So, in the last time after he was released from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicted him with, he said, Wallahi ma arsultum ilayya illa shaytanan. You just send me an evil soul. He called his, his guards and he said, she's, she's, I will not, she's evil. Of course, we know who's the evil person. But this is the twisted mind of the tyrant. They think that anybody who opposes them, anybody who goes against them, even if they are the most righteous people, like Sarah alayhi salam, they think they are evil. They have everything, all these scales completely twisted in their minds. 
And he said, Arji'uha ila Ibrahim. Take her back to Ibrahim. But he was completely taken by what happened to him. So he wanted to repel any harm that can come to him from Hajar and Ibra- uh, from uh, Sarah and Ibrahim. He said, Wa'atuha Ajar. Give her a servant. Give her Hajar. And Hajar was a servant, a jariah, in the palace of that tyrant. And he gave, so he gave Hajar, alayhi salam, as a servant to Sarah. And then Ibrahim was, was sitting there praying. Pleading with, Allah, pleading with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't know what's going on. And here he, he's expecting probably the worst. But yet he has the utmost faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has the confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here he, she is comes and she says, أَشَعَرْتَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ كَبَتَ الْفَاجِرَ وَأَخْدَمَ وَلِيدًا كَبَتَ الْكَافِرَ وَأَخْدَمَ وَلِيدًا He said, not only Allah defeated the tyrant, not only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defeated that criminal person, but Allah gave me a servant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed more bounty upon me. So she came absolutely not only safe from the evil of that tyrant, but also she came a winner. She came and Allah has honored her and gave her a, a person to help her and serve her. And we will see the importance of Hajar, as we all know, in the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam and in history. We learn many things from this encounter between Sarah, Ibrahim, and this tyrant. The first important thing that we learn from that is the ultimate tawakkul. At tawakkul ala Allah. The reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim, the only man, the weak, the immigrant, in a land of a, a Jabbar tyrant, an aggressive person who wants to take his wife. Sarah, when she was brought into this, that palace alone, a weak woman in a palace in the den of that aggressive beast. And here she is, alone, with that person in that room. And only Allah is with her. And wakatha, and Allah is enough. وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Those who rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is enough for them. And that is the, taw- the true tawakkul. They tried whatever they could to protect themselves. Ibrahim even had to, to, show, to, to trick them and said, she's my sister. Maybe he can protect himself. Maybe he can protect her. They tried what they could. They did their part. But they had the ultimate tawakkul, the ultimate le- reliance on Allah. The second lesson that we learn from this encounter, inna Allah yudafi'u anil ladina amen. That Allah defends the believers. The believers need no defense other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Allah yudafi'u anil ladina amanu. In Allah la yuhibbu kulla khawanin kafur. Allah does not like the betrayal unbeliever. And the last, one of the last things that we, we learn from this study is the importance of good deeds. The, the value of what we put before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did she pray, Sarah? How did she pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? She pleaded with Allah by her good deeds. She said, Allahumma in kunta ta'alam, anni qad amantu bika wa bi rasulik, wa ahsantu farji, illa ala zawji, fala tu salit alayya hadha al kafir. She said, Oh Allah, if you know that I truly believe in you and your prophet, and I have kept my chastity, my honor. See, she is telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what she is doing right. And she's putting her case before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with her good deeds. We know there is a famous hadith, although there may be a little digression, but I think it's worth looking into. And that hadith is also in Sahih al-Bukhari. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with both of them, he said that three people were trapped in a cave and a big rock dropped while they were resting in a cave on a journey. A big rock dropped and occluded and stopped up the exit from that cave. 
So three people, a huge rock, they're trapped inside the cave, and they cannot do anything. And they're going to stay there until they starve and die. So they're waiting for Allah. Again, Hasbi Allah wa ni'ma al-wakil. We see the importance of Hasbi Allah wa ni'ma al-wakil in the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah is enough for me. And he is the best that we can rely on. So these three people were sitting in that cave and the rock was occluding the cave and they started asking Allah and pleading before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their good deeds. Just like Sarah did before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the importance, brothers and sisters, of us to keep in our credit some good deeds. So when we are in trouble, we can call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with something. We can put something before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to call him. And they, one of them said that I had, uh, my parents were old, well elderly, and I will not drink anything or eat anything before they start it, before they take it. And one time, I came to them in the morning and I had a cup filled with milk. And I waited, and they were asleep. So I just stood there. I didn't drink anything of it until they woke up. And I made sure that they drink before I do, and after they got their fill, then my family and myself can get any of it. Oh Allah, if you know that I did this for your sake, then lift this calamity. So the rock moves a little bit. The second person said, I had a cousin, I had a relative, that she was m the most beloved person on the face of the earth for me. And she was married to someone else. And I was a rich person. And one time, in one year, there was a lot of calamities, a lot of famine, and she came to me asking me for help. And I gave her 120 dinar, and I said, that gold is yours if you give yourself to me. So because of that calamity, because of that hunger and starvation, she agreed so she can feed her family. And he said, and I was about to do the thing that Allah doesn't want me to do. She said, do not take anything that is not of your right. So he said, and I remembered Allah. And I stepped back. And I tell her, take the money, take the gold, and go for the sake of Allah. Oh Allah, if you know I did that only for you, then lift this calamity. So the rock moves a little bit more. And then the last person said, Salam rahmatullah. He said, I had a servant, and somebody worked for me. And then I used to pay the people that worked for me immediately, and then this person left before I paid him. So I took his whatever I owed him, and I started investing that money for him. And then after many years, this person just dropped and came to see me. And he said, give me my, my money. So I take him into an area that is filled with sheep and camels and cows. And I said, this is, your, this, is what I, he, this is what you, this is your money. This is what I owe you. This is what, what you deserve. And the man said, are you making fun of me? I mean, he worked, you know, just a handyman job, something small. He said, no, I invested that for you. And that is your right. And Allah is my witness. Oh Allah, if you think, if you know that I did that before you and to get you pleasure, then lift the calamity and then the rock moves down and the cave is open. So this, this, you see the similarities between what happened to Sarah the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam and this story. She pleaded with Allah with her good deed. And that is an important lesson we learn from that story. Is we have to have some good deeds. Because we all going to get in trouble. If we don't get in much trouble now, we know we're going to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. And that is the day of trouble. And if we don't have anything to offer, then we are completely bankrupt. And if nothing else, we can present what Sarah presents. We can present honor, 
chastity, and total faith, total tawheed, and iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Ibrahim alayhi salam takes his wife Sarah and their new servant Hajar and he goes back to the holy land of Palestine. And he lives there. And most of the scholars agree that Ibrahim at that time was older, was sheikh. He was in his 80s, according to some scholars. And Sarah has never, was, was never able to carry a child for Ibrahim alayhi salam. She was barren. She was not fertile. She could not have a child for Ibrahim alayhi salam. And she was getting older. And Ibrahim was getting older. And they have no progeny. They have no offspring. And Ibrahim, when you read the Quran and you read his story, you see how he always prays, was riyati, was riyati, my offspring, my progeny. He knew he is the prophet. He is Khalil al-Rahman. He is the friend of Allah. And upon his progeny falls the responsibility of prophethood, of revelation, or delivering the word of Allah to humanity. And he was so anxious to have someone that will carry his message, the message of Allah, to people. And Sarah, as much as she loved Ibrahim, she could not do that. And she knew what he wanted. And out of her love to him, she did something that is unthinkable. To many women, to most women, to see the, the, the level of sacrifice that she had. She asked Ibrahim to marry Hajar, marry her servant. So maybe Hajar will be able to conceive and have a child for Ibrahim alayhi salam. And it did happen. Ibrahim alayhi salam takes Hajar from a servant to a wife and she was able to conceive by the will of Allah and she has a child. She has a son for Ibrahim and that son was named Ismail alayhi salam. In Sahih al-Bukhari there is a very long hadith. A long hadith that we will try to go through it tonight but I think time is limited. We may have to uh, to uh, go maybe over one other session to finish it. This hadith tells us the story of Ismail, the story of Hajar, the story of Ibrahim, and the tribulation that Ibrahim, his life is filled with tribulation and trials, but that tribulation that he had to go through with Ismail and Hajar alayhim as -salam. On the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now this hadith, you will see, just also a side note there, that some of the scholars consider it as a hadith marfu'ah, meaning it is, it is not exactly the words of the Prophet wasallam in the entire hadith, it is the words of Ibn Abbas, taken from the Prophet wasallam, and then Ibn Abbas, during the hadith, will refer to some phrases that he heard from the Prophet wasallam. But it is an authentic, solid hadith, and the Al-Bukhari put it in his book, because the authenticity is extremely high and the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas is extremely high in our religion. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, the start of the hadith, that the first woman that used a girdle, something she wraps around her, and it's, it's a long dress, uh, was the mother of Ismail, which is Hajar, alayhi salam. And he said she used the girdle, a girdle so that she might hide her tracks from Sarah. So immediately you understand that although these are Sarah, Hajar, these are human beings. And there was some jealousy between Hajar and Sarah. So although Sarah herself gave Hajar to, to Ibrahim alayhi salam, yet she really hated it. She did not like that her beloved husband go with this woman all the time. She did not want Hajar to be with her husband. And so when Hajar wants to go back and forth to, to Ibrahim alayhi salam, 
she used to wear that long dress, and so she, the, the, her footsteps, the tracks, the, the footprints, will be erased as that dress drags behind her. So Sarah would not, would not get jealous. So she would not get provocated, you know, she would not get uh, uh, angry when she sees that she's going back and forth to, uh, to Ibrahim alayhi salam. They're human beings. And they get afflicted with what human beings are afflicted with. So the hadith continues from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, one day Ibrahim t- took her with her son Ismail on a journey. Ibrahim brought her and her son Ismail when she was suckling him, meaning Ismail was just an infant, a very small child. In his infancy, is totally dependent on suckling from his mother. And he takes him. And he brought her near the Kaaba, close to a tree. The Prophet ﷺ described that. He said, حتى وضعهما عند البيت عند دوحة فوق زمزم في أعلى المسجد وليس بمكة يومئذ أحد وليس بها ما. The Prophet describes to the Sahaba now the Sahaba knew where the Kaaba was they knew where Zamzam is but he's trying to tell them where the events of that story took place so when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says put them just close to the Kaaba at the site of Zamzam but you have to remember that when Ibrahim put them there, there was nothing there. There was, it was just a barren land. There was nothing. Absolutely nothing. And there is no water, as the Prophet said. وَلَيْسَ بِمَكَّةَ أَحَدٍ There is no soul that lived in Mecca at that time. And there is no water. How could people live there if there is just not one drop of water in that area? And people that went to Mecca, you know how harsh the geography is and how hard the environment is and if it is not for the well of Zamzam and the water of Zamzam Mecca would never have a life so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is explaining that to us and he said then he put them there and he put a sack of date وَضَعِنْدَهُمَا جُرَابًا فِيهِ تَمْرٍ وَسِقَاءٌ فِيهِمَا and then a bottle, not a, not a bottle, but it's just a, a sack filled with water, right? And he turned and he started walking away. Then he just turned around and he started walking away. So the mother of Ismail started walking after him. She said, Ya Ibrahim, aina tazhab? Wa bi al-wazi alladhi laysa fihi ins wala shay. Why are you leaving us in this valley that there are no human beings and there is nothing there? There is absolutely nothing. Oh, Abraham, where are you coming, leaving us in this valley where there is no person whose company we may have, nor there is anything? Then she repeated that to him many times, and he is not responding. He's not even looking at her. Why is that? Because Allah described Ibrahim in his book, Inna Ibrahim al awahun Halim. Ibrahim has a lot of passion. He's a very compassionate person. And he is given an order by his Lord. You go do this to your wife and your infant. So he's going to do it. But he was concerned that if he looked at them, if he looked at his wife pleading with him, he may get weak. He may feel that sympathy for his infant. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And he may get weak, and so he would not even look at her. He would not even look at his son as he was walking away. So he can fulfill the commands of his Lord with no hesitation. He feared that he might hesitate if he looked at his wife. And then it occurred to Hajar to ask him that question. And she said, Allahu amaraka bihada? Has Allah ordered you to do so? And Ibrahim said, Bala, naam. Yes, Allah asked me to do, Allah ordered me to do that. Allah commands me to do this. So what did this believer say? What this woman who is a believer in Allah, his, her belief in Allah is much higher than her belief in her husband or anybody else. Her dependence is on Allah. It's not on water. It's not on plants. It's not on food. 
What did she say to her husband? He said, فَإِذًا لَا يُضَيَّعُنَا Then if Allah asks you to do this, if Allah ordered you to do this, then Allah will not neglect us. Allah will not let us go astray. Allah will, let us, will not let us be wasted. ثُمَّ رَجَعَتْ Then she went back to exactly the spot where Ibrahim alayhi salam put her in. فَانْطَلَقَ Ibrahim. And Ibrahim kept walking. حَتَّى إِذَا كَانَ عِنْدَ الثَّنِيَةِ And the Prophet وسلم, is telling the Sahaba exactly where these things happen. And then he said, he, at, as he turned the corner in a certain place where she cannot see him. She cannot see the distress he was in. She cannot see how much he was suffering. Then when he was where he cannot be seen by his wife, he said, اسْتَقْبَلَ بِوَجْهِهِ الْبَيْتِ He turned his face towards the Qibla. And then he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in the Quran in Surah Ibrahim, verse number 37. O oh, Allah, I have our Lord, I have made some of my offspring to dwell in an uncultivated valley by your sacred house. So he's telling Allah, he's, Allah is all knowing. He's putting his case before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, this is also an evidence that the ulama said that Ibrahim knew exactly where the Kaaba is. The Kaaba was not built at that time, but Ibrahim knew that this is the spot of Al Kaaba. This is the house of Allah. Why does he do that? What is the, the purpose of all of that? رَبَّنَا لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ O oh Allah, so they may perform salah. It is to elevate the word of Tawheed. He said, I will, I'm sacrificing my wife, I'm sacrificing my son, the only son I have, so your word can be high. So your religion can be spread, as you told me, as you commanded me. لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ And then he prayed. فَاجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ وَارْزُقْهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ So, fill some hearts among men, among people with love towards them. And O oh Allah, provide them with fruits so they may, that they may, may give thanks. So they may praise you. And then, the hadith continues. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَجَعَلَتْ أُمُّ إِسْمَعِيلَ تُرْضِ إِسْمَعِيلَ وَتَشْرَبْ مِنْ ذَلِكَ الْمَاءِ Then she started suckling him, she started nursing his, her infant, and she had the dates and the water, and she consumed them. She drank all the water she has. And there was no more water left. And Ibrahim is gone. Now for a moment, just really, we know the end of the story. We all know the story of Ibrahim. But just put yourself in that position with Hajar. How would you feel? What do you think? I mean, an infant crying, and she completely dries up. She cannot nurse him if she is dehydrated. If the woman is, is not, she cannot, she cannot eat and she could not drink, how can she nurse? How can she give? milk to the baby. And then Atishat wa Atishabnaha. See the hadith is so accurate. First she was thirty, then the child was thirty, thirsty. So first she got dehydrated, she could not produce any more milk, now the child is suffering. Now the infant is suffering. And she started looking at him and he is curling and turning from the pain of hunger, from the screaming. She sees her son, her only son suffering, in the middle of the desert. There is no cultivation, there is no water, and there is just nothing she can do. And then what does she do? Does she sit there and wait to die? It's not what a mu'min does. Right, we have to learn, you know, the story itself is not the objective here. Like I said, most of us, inshallah, know these stories. We try to learn what to do. She is in amazing peril. And what does she do? 
a woman, a weak woman. She said, I'm not going to die, and I'm not going to let my son die. i got to do something. So she looks around. She wants help. How can she call for help? She needs to go to a higher place. So she can look around and see if there's anybody around. If there's anything green inside. Maybe there is some water around it. So she gets up on a little mountain called as safa The Prophet ﷺ said, فَوَجَدَتِ الصَّفَى أَقْرَبَ جَبَلٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ The closest elevation in earth, close to the area where the Kaaba is, is as as we all know. The closest mount is as -Safa. So she gets up on as -Safa. She looks around. There is nothing there. And he said, حَتَّى فَهَبَطَتْ مِنَ الصَّفَى Then she comes down from as -Safa. حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْوَادِي Then she walks around in that valley. And she heads on to the next mountain, to the next little hill. It's called Al Marwa. And she goes there and she runs. And she gets there and she gets up on the Marwa. She looks around. There's nothing in that direction. She comes back again. And she runs back to As Safa. She gets up on the Safa. She looks around. Baby's crying. No water. No food. Nothing green inside. Stop. No not Hajar. She comes down again. She runs back to As-Safa, to Al-Marwa. She gets up. She looks around. She comes down one more time to As-Safa, to Al-Marwa, to As-Safa, to Al-Marwa. She will not give up. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, after seven times, she was up there on the Marwa. And the Prophet commented at that particular point in the hadith, Ibn Abbas said, قَالَ نَبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ ذَلِكَ سَعْيُ النَّاسِ بَيْنَهُمَا And that is the sa'i. That is why we perform sa'i between al-Safa and al-Marwa. We are following in the footsteps of this believer. Now if anybody tells you Islam is biased against women, tell them about the sa'i. Tell them every Muslim, male or female, follows in the footsteps of Hajar. Because Hajar is a role model for Muslims, males or females. And we will talk about that in a second. So the Prophet ﷺ said, When she got up in the seventh time to the level of Al Marwa, she got up there, she heard something. فقالت صح. She said, Shh, hush. She was panting and she was loud and she was, you know, tired and exhausted. So she told herself to quiet down. So she wants, she's not sure if what she hears was something true or hallucination. She started to listen hard. She heard something. And she then started calling to that voice. And she said, قَدْ أَسْمَعْتَ I hear you. إِنْ كَانَ عِنْدَكَ غَوَاثِ If you can help me. And then she looks at the place where she left her infant Ismail. And the Prophet ﷺ said, فَإِذَا هِيَ بِالْمَلَكِ عِنْدَ مَوْضِعِ زَمْزَمْ And there is an angel at the site of Zamzam. فَبَحَثَ بِعَقِبِهِ أَوْ بِجَنَاحِ There are two, Ibn Abbas reported two, two things. He said he, so he dug the ground either with his heel or with his wing. He made a hole in the ground. And then water starts springing up. So she runs down to that water. She cannot believe the miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent her an angel to help her and her infant because she relied on Allah. Because she told her husband, go. Allah will not let us go astray. And here is Allah sends his angel to dig water for her. So she is very happy. And she runs to that water. And she, the Prophet ﷺ said, She started taking some of that water, drinking, and she wants to give her son. She started forming a little basin so the water would not go out. She, she didn't know what, what she, she was trying. She said, you know, some water is coming out. I better get every drop of it 
Let's not waste anything out of that water. So made a little basin around, around that water. And she said, zoom, zoom. Zoom is just stay here. Don't go anywhere. It's talking to the water. And the water obeyed. Water stayed there. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يَرْحَمُ اللَّهَ إِمُّ إِسْمَعِي May Allah have mercy on the mother of Ismail. لَوْ تَرَكَتْ زَمْزَمْ If only just let the water flow. So the water was flowing and she was ordering the water to stay in. He said, if, it, if she let it go, لَكَانَ زَمْزَمُ عَيْنًا مَعِينًا Zamzam would have been a stream, would have been a river flowing on the face of the earth. Allah opened his mercy and there is no limit. But she wanted it to stay there, so it stayed there. So the water obeyed the servant of Allah because she obeyed Allah. The water was responding to Hajar because she responded to Allah. This is what happens when we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So she said, فَشَرِبَتْ وَأَرْضَعَتْ وَلَدَهَا Then she drank. And she fed her baby. And then the angel said, لا تخاف الضيع. Don't be worried. Don't worry about being lost here in the wilderness. There is nothing around you. He said, the angel said, don't be afraid of being neglected. For this is the house of Allah, which will be built by this boy and his father. And then he said, والله لا يضيع أهله. Allah does not neglect his people. If you are one of the people of Allah, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Have you ever wondered why we ever live this story in Hajj every year? Have you ever wondered why is this so important that the entire rituals of Hajj are based on it? Are based on Ibrahim, Hajar, Ismail, and the stories to come. Because there is so much in it. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he left a woman and an infant that he loved, that his hopes are all in that infant. It was his entire progeny. Everything he helped for was in that infant. And when Allah said, leave him, he left him. Do we have that tawakkul? Do we have that, that degree of faith? When Allah said, don't do this, do we argue? When Allah said, you know, don't, don't, don't do that. When Allah said, do it. Oh, I, I'm not convinced yet that this is what I need to do. You, know, you hear that? Is that the level of iman that Allah wants us to do? Is that the level of submission of a Muslim? Allah said to, to Ibrahim, leave your son and your wife in an uncultivated valley. And he did. The faith of Hajar herself. She just had to ask her husband one question. Did Allah ask, order you to do this? Is it Allah's command? That's all she needed to know. And he said yes. And that's, she didn't ask any other question. Did she ask him, how are we going to get water? Ask Allah how we're going to get water. Allah wants us to be here. Don't you see some followers of some prophets, they will say that? We will study that. We will come to some people that they will say, go ask your Lord what to do. Right? We know, we know what we're talking about. Did she ask, well ask Allah how we're going to drink then. Ask Allah what we're going to eat. Ask Allah how we're going to nurse my baby. She didn't need any, any questions other than, is it Allah's plan or your plan? See, she had more faith in Allah than her faith in the friend of Allah. Right? You said, well, it's Allah's plan, we're fine. It'll be okay. She didn't know how. She was running up and down frantically from al Safa to Al-Marwa. That tells us she really had no idea. She had no idea what to do. She was just making sa'i. Sa'i is not a word that you should take lightly. The word sa'i is, is, is everything, is really struggling, is you're striving, is you're putting your effort. This is what sa'i means. Allah said, وَأَن لَيْسَ مِنْ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا وَتْ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى وَأَنَّ سَعَيَهُ سَوْفَ يُرَى ثُمَّ يُعْفَاهُ الْجَزَاءَ الْأَوْفَى 
Allah said, الإنسان, the human being has only his sa'i. That's why we make sa'i. We put effort. She had no idea what's going to happen. Do we think that her sa'i actually brings the water? No. I mean, if she just stayed there, maybe the same thing would have happened. Maybe not. But Allah wanted her to put her effort. This is the true meaning of tawakkul. When you make tawakkul on Allah, when you rely on Allah, you should put your sa'i forward. You should do your part. And leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sa'i may not be related to the results. It doesn't produce the results. Allah does. But Allah wants us to do our part. And if we don't do our part, then He'll leave us. But here is Hajar. She is the role model for us. And she did her say Seven times and she didn't lose hope. Nobody loses hope with Allah. Nobody that has faith loses hope in Allah. The next long story we're going to have, inshallah, is the story of Yusuf. And Yaqub, his father, Jacob. He tells his, his children when... when when they come to him and they said, after 40 years of Yusuf being gone, he said, Tallahi tafta'u tazkura Yusuf. Oh, Tallah, you, you keep mentioning Yusuf? Haven't you given up hope yet? Are you, you know, hatta takuna haraba. You want to kill yourself mentioning Yusuf? You think Yusuf is coming back? A Muslim does not lose hope, ever. What does he say? He said, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي مِنَ اللَّهِ وَأَعْلَمُوا مِنَ اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ يَا بَنِي يَذْهَبُوا فَتَحَسَّسُوا مِنْ رَمِي يُوسُفَ وَأَخِيهِ وَلَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Never lose hope, he says. Never lose hope in Allah. Never give up on Allah. Because those who give up on Allah, who lose hope with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are the ones that will go astray. You do your work and Allah has plans. You are not the planner. Allah is. But Allah gives us the, the road map. He's what you need to do. In everything. Wallahi, Islam has no... No, there are nothing that you need to question in Islam. Because everything is planned out for you. About what to do. You should never be bewildered. What should I do if this happens and should that happen? You do your part. وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ And when that happens, everything will be in your hand. Everything that Allah created will work for you. Even the water responded to Zamzam. Even Zamzam responded to Hajar. The water obeyed Hajar. She said, you stay there, water stayed there. Why, why did that happen? Why the Prophet ﷺ told us, if she did not say that, it would have been a river. Not for us to say, oh, wallahi, she should not have said that. That's not the point. The point is Allah, when Allah is with you, everything becomes with you. And nothing can change that. Except time now. We're out of time. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us fulfill our religion and to help us have the meaning of true tawakkul or truly reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman wa fiqhan fi al-deen ya rabbal alameen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mufsaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.